My name is Professor Basil Leonard and I am today at the We Read For You which is uh, sponsored by USB Ed and Finweek and for today I will be reviewing the book Originals which is by Adam Grant and very important here is the subtitle of the book which is how nonconformists can change the world. Much of what the book deals with is how we like to rather conform as over against being original. But to make that point valid, he takes us through eight chapters filled with anecdotes and stories and all kinds of interesting research studies, which goes into very many different companies. And so I would encourage you to not just watch this particular clip, but also to go out there, get the book, and read it for yourself. And chapter one, as I said, is creative destruction, and the subtitle is The Risky Business of Going Against the Grain. And he's got a most beautiful quote here from George Bernard Shaw. He says, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. And so then he proceeds to explain from where he writes, what does he mean by an original? And as an adjective, he says it's the origin or source of something from which something springs, proceeds, or is derived. As a noun, of course, it's a thing of singular or unique character. There, he says there are two ways to achieve, um, two routes to achievement. The one is conformity, <coughs> and the other one is originality. Nothing, he says, is completely original. All ideas are influenced by what we learn. He then says originality starts with creativity. In other words, generating a concept that is both novel and useful. You can see how every time he brings that second part in. But it doesn't stop there. Originals are people who take the initiative to make their visions a reality. He says the hallmark of originality is rejecting the default and exploring where a better option exists. The starting point then is pondering why the default exists in the first place. Originals are wired to embrace uncertainty, to ignore social approval. They simply don't worry about the cost of non-conformity the way the rest of us do. He says, Using studies and theory spanning business, politics, sports, entertainment, he then looked at the seeds of creative, moral, and organizational change, and the barriers that hinder progress. So the book has three sections thereafter. It focuses on managing the risks involved in generating, recognizing, voicing original ideas. Then it deals with the choices that we make to scale originality. And there's again that dilemma of timing. And then finally, the third section, unleashing and sustaining originality, both at home and at work. Let's look at chapter two then. Blind inventors and one-eyed inventors. And this is the art and science, he says, of recognizing original ideas. Scott Adams says, creativity is allowing yourself to make mistakes. And look at the second part to the quote. Art is knowing which ones to keep. <laughs> and so this chapter deals with the hurdles and the best practices in idea selection. Because you're going to be bombarded with ideas. People who want you to invest, you see. So how do you make up your mind? Where do you go? So he refers to some social scientists who actually say we are overconfident when we evaluate ourselves. <coughs> So overconfidence, he then says, is a particular, particularly difficult bias to overcome in the creative domain. Please look at this. He says it is widely assumed that there's a trade-off between quantity and quality if you want to do better work. When it comes to idea generation, quantity is the most predictable path to quality. He says also, don't be afraid to gather feedback. So as you put a lot of ideas out there, see which ones are praised and are adopted by your audience. 
And then he speaks about the double-edged sword of experience. Research on highly creative adults show that they tended to move to new cities much more frequently than their peers in childhood, which gave them exposure to different cultures and values and encouraged flexibility and adaptability. So if the only place you've ever lived is Cape Town, you are really limited by that. Let's go to chapter three then. And this is the one that I said it really needs for a good, makes for a good read, speaking truth to power. He says, great spirits have always encountered opposition from mediocre minds. This is the chapter which is about when to speak up, how to do it effectively, but please watch, without jeopardizing our careers and our relationships. What are the right times to raise our voices and what steps can we take to get heard? A chapter that, or a section of this chapter that I found amazing is this power without status. Which should we go for? Do I go for power? Do I go for status? It says leaders and managers appreciate it when employees take the initiative to offer help, to build networks, to gather new knowledge, and to seek feedback. But there's one form of initi initiative that gets penalized when you speak up with suggestions. So he says when we climb up the moral ladder, it can be rather lonely at the top. But that doesn't mean you don't keep putting out. See, remember, originals will keep putting out. You don't now say, oh, well, I spoke once and they don't hear. Power involves two things. Exercising control or authority over others. Here's an interesting thing about speaking truth to power, which he calls quitting before leaving. He says, there you are in a situation and you have basically four things that you can do about it. You can change the situation. You can help to maintain the status quo. You can do something that would be detrimental to the organization, or you can do something that's beneficial. The two areas that show that it's beneficial to the organization is when you voice and you persist. I'm not, I'm not letting you go. I'm hanging in there with you. The other side, of course, which could be detrimental to the organization is when I leave or I neglect which means I've, I've told you that we must do ABC, you haven't listened, I don't care anymore. Chapter four has to do with fools rushing in. This is your timing, what he calls strategic procrastination, and the first mover disadvantage. What he's basically doing here is saying to us that you don't always have to be the first to put your idea out there. You could be third, but it could be such an improved improvement on what the original person put out there, that yours goes and theirs didn't. This chapter considers the question of when to take original action. The goal is to overturn common assumptions about timing by examining the unexpected benefits of delaying when we start and finish a task as well as when we unleash our ideas into the world. The chapter also deals with why procrastination can be as much a virtue as a vice. He now goes into being original does not require being first, it just means being different and better. So the economist David Gallinson actually answered why some originals peak early and others bloom late. And he discovered two radically different styles of innovation. Some of us innovate conceptually, but others innovate experimentally. In chapter five, Creating and Maintaining Coalitions, he starts with Dr. Seuss. I don't know how many of you have ever read this, but it's beautiful. So this chapter examines how originals form alliances to advance their goals and how to overcome the barriers that prevent coalitions from succeeding. So the key insight for him is the Goldilocks theory of coalition formation. He says the originals who start a movement will often be its most radical members whose ideas and ideals will prove too hot for those who follow their lead. So you don't want to touch it. But to form alliances with opposing groups, it's best to temper the cause, cooling it as much as possible. Yet to draw allies into joining the cause itself, what's needed 
is a moderately tempered message that is neither too hot nor too cold, but just right. <laughs> Kelman, in a section which he calls United We Stand, and this is about creating coalitions across conflict lines, says when he studied conflict between Israel and Palestine, conflicts between two groups are often caused and intensified by conflicts within the groups. So to build coalitions across conflict lines, it's really effective to send hawks to negotiate. You need the doves in each group to sit down. So this chapter examines the family roots of originality. What's unique about a younger child? How does family size figure in? What are the implications for nurture? How can we account for the cases that don't fit in? When many of us make decisions, we follow a logic of consequence, he says. In other words, which cause will produce the best result? He's now saying, however, if you consistently challenge the status quo, you actually operate differently, using instead a logic of appropriateness. What does a person like me do in a situation like this? The differences in personality don't exist between families, but within families. And then in chapter 7, he goes into the myths of strong cultures, cults, and devil's advocates, and the chapter is called Rethinking Groupthink. So here he examines what really causes groupthink and what we can do to prevent it. Why are some cohesive groups vulnerable to bad decisions while others do just fine? What does it take to maintain a strong culture without spawning a cult. So, if you're a leader and you're going to talk to your employees, how would you fill in the blank in the sentence? Don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. And the book says, wrong. <laughs> Look at this. A culture that focuses too heavily on solutions becomes a culture of advocacy, dampening inquiry. Because we don't raise problems, we only look at solutions to things. But there could be other things that needed to be raised. <coughs> and then in the last chapter, Managing Anxiety, Apathy, Ambivalence and Anger, this is where he quotes Nelson Mandela. He says, Nelson Mandela said, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. And so in this chapter, he actually examines the emotional drama involved in going against the grain. He says, although many originals come across as beacons of conviction and confidence, on the outside, their inner experiences are peppered with ambivalence and self-doubt. So psychologist Julie Norum says, there are two different strategies for handling these challenges. You can be a strategic optimist, or you can be a defensive pessimist. If you're a strategic optimist, then you anticipate the best. You stay calm, and you set high expectation. If you're a defensive op a pessimist, then you expect the worst. Feeling anxious, and imagine all the things that can go wrong. And one of the originators of emotional intelligence, Peter Salovey, he says it depends on whether they perceive the new behavior as safe or risky. If perceived as safe, we will emphasize all the good outcomes. If perceived as risky, we destabilize the status quo and accentuate the bad thing that will happen if they don't change. And so, to counter apathy, he says, most change agents focus on presenting an inspiring vision of the future. This is an important message, but it is not the type of communication that should come first. If you want people to take risk, you need to show what's wrong with the present. To drive people out of their comfort zones, you have to cultivate dissatisfaction, frustration, anger at the current state of affairs, making it a guaranteed loss. This is how he concludes, becoming original is not the easiest path in the pursuit of happiness, but it leaves us perfectly poised for the happiness of pursuit. And I took one of his other quotes, which I think I would like to end with. It's from the book. I arise in the morning, E.B. White says, 
torn between a desire to improve the world and to a desire to enjoy the world. This makes it difficult to plan the day. <laughs> I thank you.